Case at 12. The news at noon starts right now. A big story we're continuing to follow this noon. A federal judge has now temporarily blocked the new abortion law that went into effect here in Texas last month. The judge ruling in favor of the Biden administration stopping enforcement of the law, which bans abortions after six weeks of pregnancy. ABC's Rita Roy reports that despite the ruling, some providers here are now hesitant to offer abortions again. Flagrantly unconstitutional, that's what a federal judge deemed the strictest abortion law in the nation before blocking the state of Texas from enforcing it for now. Clearly he believes that the way the laws uh, are in effect now, the federal laws with respect to abortion, that those should be followed, those should be adhered to. In a 113-page opinion, the judge calling the abortion ban an offensive deprivation of an important right after the Justice Department sued Texas to challenge it. This is a really major victory for the Biden Justice Department. The law bans abortions after six weeks of pregnancy with no exception for rape or incest. It also gives private citizens the right to sue anyone who aids and abets an unlawful abortion. ABC News was there when the law went into effect last month. She was crying um, and we began to explore options and think through the logistics of if she would be able to go out of state for the care that she needed. In a statement, White House officials call this an important step forward, but also say there's much more to go in the battle over abortion rights. The state of Texas has appealed the judge's ruling, which means the law could end up in the Supreme Court again. Some providers are now hesitant to offer abortions again, worried they may be sued retroactively if the law is reinstated. Rena Roy, ABC News, New York. Pfizer officially asking the Food and Drug Administration to approve its COVID vaccine for emergency use in five to 11 year olds. That's according to the company's trial data. It's a dose one third the size that's used in adults and children 12 and older, producing strong enough immune responses in children when using the same two dose regimen as in adults. Pfizer admitted the data uh, submitted that data to the FDA last month, but didn't say until today it's asking for emergency use authorization. The FDA's advisory committee is discussing vaccines. It had already planned a meeting for October 26 in anticipation of this request. In local news, a Northeast Side family recovering from a frightening night in their own home for one of them. Part of that recovery has been at a hospital. Police say a three-year-old girl was hurt when a suspected drunk driver plowed his car right into her bedroom. It happened on Windale Street, and as Katrina Weber reports, her father is grateful for a stranger who comforted her. The sight is enough to take your breath away. A car protruding from what had been a little girl's bedroom in the 600 block of Windale. I was uh, woken up by police, San Antonio police, um, and at that moment, um, I realized what happened. Carlos Duran and his three children were inside the home late last night, most of them sleeping through it all. He says his three-year-old daughter, whose bed was against that wall, was sent flying about six feet, along with bricks, drywall, and a planter. The main complaint when she was a little bit shaken up, um, she, uh, it was like her eyes were full of uh, dirt and, and debris. As it turned out, Duran isn't the only one to sleep through all of this. Several neighbors who were early risers stopped by wondering what happened. They tell us because this neighborhood is in a flight path, a lot of these homes were built to block out the noise. San Antonio police say the driver got out and tried to run. But they caught that suspect, identified as 49-year-old Charles Slaughter, and arrested him on charges, including driving while intoxicated. Another driver, who happened to be a nurse, stopped after the crash and helped Duran's daughter. That was an angel. Uh, that's, that's all I have to say, and I'm very thankful uh, for her. Duran also is grateful that all his children made it through safely. He says the three-year-old suffered only minor injuries. Katrina Weber, KSAT 12 News. San Antonio City Council has just voted to approve an incentive package for the Spurs organization as it plans to build a new facility on the northwest side. The facility would sit near Lock and Terra just outside Loop 1604 and would include a practice facility for the team, office space, a park, and Human Performance Research Institute. In return for getting that park land, which the Spurs say that they will maintain and operate, Bear County has already committed $15 million toward this project. 
and on the city of San Antonio side, it's offering up 17 million in tax rebates over 20 to 23 years, provided the Spurs meet the benchmarks like creating new jobs. New at noon, a pair of robbery suspects on the run. However, police are hoping to stop them in their tracks. This after officers say they stole from a store and slashed an employee with a knife on the way out the door. These are the suspects police are trying to find. The pictures taken by surveillance cameras at a sporting goods store in the 300 block of Northwest Loop 410. That's near North Star Mall. Police say the pair walked into the store and started grabbing up things and then started to leave without paying. That's when an employee confronted them and police say one of the suspects pulled out a knife and attacked the worker. That worker had a cut on their hand. The suspects ran off before the officers got to the scene. If you can help police find these guys, call SAPD's Robbery Task Force Unit. It is 210-207-0300. Several months after a man was shot and killed, a suspect is now facing charges. Police charged 35-year-old Jose Rodriguez Moreno with murder. He's accused of shooting and killing Adam Hernandez back in June in the 1800 block of East South Cross. That's near Highway 281 on the south side. Now, back in June, police found the victim on a sidewalk. According to arrest paperwork, detectives were able to connect Rodriguez Moreno to the shooting because shell casings found at the scene matched a rifle he had. Students, teachers, and parents still shaken up a day after a shooting at a high school in North Texas. Three students and a teacher were hurt. We brought you this breaking news on News at Noon yesterday. Today, ABC's Marcus Moore reports the suspect's family now speaking on his behalf, asking for forgiveness and giving a possible motive for his actions. All classes and after-school activities have been canceled here at Timberview High School as students recount the horrific scene inside the building as shots rang out on Wednesday afternoon. Panic and chaos here at this high school as a student allegedly opened fire in his classroom, injuring three students and a teacher. 25-year-old English teacher Calvin Pettit is being heralded as a hero as he tried to get his students to safety. He was wounded in the shooting. And we've seen videos of students locking themselves in their rooms as the horror unfolded outside. The alleged gunman is 18-year-old student Timothy Simpkins. He turned himself in after a massive, hours-long manhunt. And overnight, his parents speaking out saying that he was the victim of bullying. Now, right now, authorities are looking at the possibility that a fight that was posted on social media may have had something to do with the shooting. We saw videos of desperate parents waiting to be reunited with their children. We understand from authorities that they did recover a 45 caliber handgun two miles away from the school and that three of the four victims were taken to the hospital, including a 15 year old who was said to be in critical condition. Simpkins has been charged with three counts of aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. And in the meantime, we're learning more about the injured teacher. One student told me that in class, he often says that the students are more important to him than himself. So they're not at all surprised that he jumped to help as those shots rang out. Marcus Moore, ABC News, Arlington, Texas. U.S. Secretary of Education is in town to promote the president's Build Back Better initiative. Miguel Cardona, joined by Congressman Joaquin Castro, touring Gus Garcia University School this morning. Cardona also spoke to students directly during a roundtable discussion addressing how to build back better, how the Build Back Better agenda could impact students. And it means more when you see faces that represent what that actually means. When you're able to see partnership with a middle school and college, giving students an opportunity to see themselves as college graduates, coming back to make the community better, um, I love that partnership. The conversation also touched on how students feel about being back in class. We're looking for a hot weekend, then some fronts head our way. Maybe some rain chances, too. We're looking at the seven-day forecast coming up. Also coming up in a few minutes, just a couple of days ago, the Cowboys released linebacker Jalen Smith. Wasn't out of work long. He's got a new job. Larry Mears with that coming up in sports. Check out this young accordion player enjoying the spotlight for a bit after he took the stage at a local music festival. How the eight-year-old's grandpa helped spark his interest in this instrument after the break.
What does the future hold for Conjunto Music, a rhythmic beat popular across South and Central Texas that dates back to the end of the 19th century? There's a local eight-year-old boy who is proving this style of music is still going strong. He showed off his skills on a big stage alongside the Garcia brothers. His name is Hector Yamas. He shared with Alicia Barrera how he made it onto the stage and what he wants to be when he grows up. It's the sound that, for Hector, means family and big dreams. My grandpa was playing it, and it was my first time seeing it, and I liked it, and he gave it to me, but it was too heavy for me. That was at the age of three, and now, five years later, he's become more confident in his craft. And Saturday at the Come and Take It, he was also able to go on stage as well and play a song with the Garcia Brothers. their signatures on it. We did not think he was going to go up there and he started playing it in the crowd and they took him up there. They were like, come on up and he played a song and he did really, really good. The cheers from the crowd and support from the Garcia brothers who got their start in Eagle Pass have inspired Hector and his grandpa to continue playing to keep the spirit and magic of Conjunto music and the stories it tells alive. This is a future. This is a future right here. I want to be able to be like Ramon Ayala. Passing it forward there. <laughs> I think Alicia said earlier that you have to have those dance moves down to be able to play that that uh, instrument too. You got to be able to move. It's and it's, get that it's beat a heavy going. equipment, a piece of equipment yeah. too. Looking outside, another ditto day. Real pretty again. Ditto day. I like that. That sums it up well. Same thing over again. We're going to see more of uh, the same going into the weekend, but things do change next week. Some rain, some fronts, maybe not a big cold front, but some fronts in the forecast. The aquifer is down four tenths of a foot, 659.2. In your pollen count, we're doing a little bit better today. Molds are down. They're at 860 moderate. Ragweed at 150 moderate. Fall elm and pigweed are both low. We look ahead to next week and hopefully some of those rain chances coming up. These uh, low humidity days are coming to an end soon. Are you taking advantage yet? I'm trying to. Did you walk farther than the car? <laughs> no. Justin? <laughs> I just didn't sweat walking to the car. Yeah, yeah. We, you got to get out and just, just do a little bit. How many more days do we have? Like two? Pretty much. Yeah. I, I think by Sunday it's going to be really kind of sticky and hot and See? summer like. You got to enjoy it now. So Saturday, I need to get up early and go do something. Yes. You must. Yes. No, no college football for you. Oh, no, no, no. Wait, hold on. <laughs> Back up. Struck a nerve. Uh, let's talk about October. It's a transition month. Uh, we know that. We start off the month averaging 87 for a high, 66 for a low. By the time we finish out the month, we're down to 77 for an average high, 56 for an average low. So this is one of the months where we see the, the average temperatures really start to come down because we start to see fronts, of course. There are a couple in the forecast. They don't know that they're going to really big, be big cool downs, but at least they are there. We'll show them to you here in just a second. First, we go outside. Blue skies, and it is nice. 82 at the airport, 87 down there at Stinson. Continues to be the warm spot around town. 83 both Kelly and Randolph. And it is another ozone action day. We should pass that along for those who have respiratory issues or asthma with the ozone levels where they are. You may want to stay indoors today. It looks like things will get better tomorrow. Temperature wise around the area, 79 Bernie Stage, 82 in Bandera, 82 in Kerrville. You're at 88 in Carrizo Springs, 90 already in Cotua. And you'll get well into the 90s today down to the south of town. 84 Gonzalez, 85 in Kennedy. Dew point tracker. Two points, as Ursula pointed out, nice for a couple days, and then they start to come up over the weekend. You'll really notice it's Sunday. Now, notice we get a little dip on Monday. That's our first front. It's weak. Don't know that it's going to do a whole lot for us, but it does drop dew points a little bit before they come right back up on Tuesday. And that is a really high dew point for fall. We're going to see a lot of moisture in the atmosphere, and there could be some good rain as we get into the middle part of next week. Here's the big picture. We still got a low spinning here across Missouri, and boy, did they get a lot of rain yesterday across parts of uh, Alabama and Georgia. Look at some of these totals. These are rainfall estimates. 
estimates by the radar, but we're talking seven, eight, nine, ten inches of rain around Birmingham, Alabama, Huntsville, Alabama. It's been busy there. Thankfully, that area of low pressure is moving away. And here in Texas, we haven't felt any of that rain. It's been very, very quiet. So here's the future casts. And as we fast forward to the weekend, we know it will be hot both Saturday and Sunday. Unfortunately, on Sunday, we add humidity to the mix, too. So we're going to be looking at heat indices, I think, by Sunday afternoon. Our first week front starts to move in on Monday. This is 8 a.m. There's a small window for rain. I'd say about a 20% chance, and it's going to be overnight Sunday, first half of the day on Monday if we're going to get anything at all. This front doesn't really move through, ends up moving back to the north as a warm front, so we don't really get the benefits of cooler air or drier air. By the time we get into Tuesday, still pretty warm and humid. There could be a couple of thunderstorms popping up, although I think rain chances are fairly low on Tuesday. By Wednesday, here comes the next front. This one's a little bit stronger, so we're going to up the rain chances to 30%. We may also tap into some Pacific moisture. There's a tropical system that is forecast to develop. Some of that moisture may work its way into Texas. If that all comes together, I think we'll be able to raise rain chances by the middle part of next week, Wednesday into Thursday. Something to watch, and that would be obviously a a good change in the forecast, I suppose. Today, though, sunny skies, 90 degrees, the high temperature. Temperatures fall into the 70s this evening and eventually 60s. Uh, Thursday night football tonight looks great, so we'll see comfortable conditions. 91 Friday, 93 Saturday. Humidity is back on Sunday. Right now, we're going with a 20% chance Monday morning, 10% chance Tuesday, 30% chance on Wednesday. But as we get closer, we may get to raise those rain chances middle part of next week, guys. I hope we do. Thank you, Justin. If anybody ever questioned why the Spurs brought Brent Forbes back to play for the Spurs, that answer came to you last night. It did. I mean, he is uh, really stroking the three-pointers right mm -hmm. now, and he's really been working on it, he says, pretty darn hard. And he saw that payoff last season at Milwaukee. Well, so far early on in the preseason, Forbes is just dropping three-pointers left and right. And in the NFL, Davis Mills, Texans rookie quarterback, says his confidence is still as strong as ever. Coming up. Season basketball, the Spurs lost at the Pistons last night, 115 to 105. Lonnie Walker, the fourth, scored 13 points, driving and scoring in the paint. Nice moves. Other end now, Doug McDermott is going to block the shot. Derek White saves the ball from going out of bounds to Lonnie, who then goes bounce pass to Keldon Johnson for some jam. Keldon led all the Spurs starters with 18 points. And our former Michigan State Spartan guard, Bryn Forbes, had a nice game for the Spurs off the bench with a game at best 20 points, hitting six of eight three-point attempts. Spurs fought back from 17 points down in the first quarter to go up by three in the third. Yeah, man, I think we got a, uh, we got a lot of tough young guys, you know, that want to compete. Um, you know, we're going to make mistakes. There's some learning we got to do, I think. But um, but I, I, I'll go out to, to play with them any day. You know, they, they want to compete. You know, we got some we got some hungry young guys. So Spurs will continue preseason play versus the Miami Heat Friday night at 730. Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. Not long after being cut by the Dallas Cowboys, linebacker Jaden Smith is heading to the Green Bay Packers. Now, the boys still owe him $7.2 million this season, but by making the cut, the Cowboys would save $9 million in the salary cap next season. Smith and Leighton Van Der Esch became expendable after the Cowboys drafted Micah Parsons and Jabril Cox this year. Dallas did not pick up the fifth-year option on Van Der Esch for next season. Now, letting Smith go even caught his Dallas teammates off guard. I was just laying down in bed watching TV. My mom come pounding on my door. Oh, my God, oh, my God, Jalen. And I was like, what are you talking about? And I just looked on the line and I heard the news. And, you know, I was just like, wow. And, you know, I was, you know, really upset about it. Cowboys running back Ezekiel Elliott didn't practice yesterday, resting a sore knee, and Lyle Collins has filed for a temporary restraining order to try and prevent the NFL from further enforcing his suspension without pay. That still has two games left on it before kickoff against the Giants Sunday. Losers of three in a row, the Texans will try to rebound Sunday when they host New England. Quarterback Davis Mills and the Texans were shut up by Buffalo in week four, 40 to nothing. Mills, who went 11 for 21 for 87 yards with four picks in the game, was asked if he's still confident after that rough outing. 
definitely. I mean, I've always been a confident person. I think from last week there was a lot to learn from, and I'm glad I kind of got some of those things out of the way so I can learn from it and hopefully improve from improve on it going forward. Mill said he's looking forward to the challenge of facing the Pats defense. Kick is noon Sunday at NRG Stadium, and the Patriots are favored by nine. When these guys, young guys, these mm -hmm. rookies always have these problems. Yep. And people think, oh, no, what they do, what they do. And I always think back to Troy Aikman. Okay, yeah. Remember his first year, oh, yeah, like 1 in 15. That's a good one to look back on, sure. Won three Super Bowls. <laughs> Just saying. Takes time. Give him a little bit. The National Energy Assistance Directors Association thinks that your gas bill could go up. We're going to take a look at the predicted hike coming up in our next half hour. And Christmas will be here before you know it. And that means wish lists are probably in the works. But kinks in the supply chain might make finding those most wanted items a little more tough. Coming up today at 5, Marilyn Morris explains what you might run into this holiday shopping season and how one local toy store is already learning to adapt. Now to Washington, where a deal to raise the debt limit may be coming together, but only for a temporary fix. Senators were negotiating at the Capitol into the early morning hours. ABC's Ike Ajachi reports that's an indication that Democrats and Republicans may be closer to a deal than ever. After hours of negotiations with his Republican counterpart, Majority Leader Chuck Schumer announced the crisis over the debt limit has been temporarily averted. We have reached agreement to extend the debt ceiling through early December, and it's our hope that we can get this done as soon as today. Without a deal in two weeks, the nation will default on its loans if Congress fails to raise the debt ceiling, something that's never happened before. Experts saying the impact on the economy would be catastrophic. Millions of jobs would be lost, and millions of seniors who depend on Social Security for their support would have to make awful choices, such as deciding whether to pay rent or buy groceries. Wednesday, President Biden going on the offensive, traveling to Michigan to speak to business leaders and CEOs about the ramifications of failing to raise the debt ceiling, pointing at Republicans as the cause for the potential economic disaster. The path Republicans offer would take us right to the brink and cause irreparable economic damage, in my view. After facing mounting pressure, Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell reversing course and offering Democrats a path forward to raise the debt ceiling. The pathway our Democratic colleagues have accepted will spare the American people any near-term crisis. Now, Schumer says he hopes the Senate will vote today to raise the debt ceiling by $480 billion, which the Treasury Department says is the amount needed to make it through December 3rd. Ike Ajachi, ABC News, Washington. As Pfizer moves to get emergency youth authorization for its vaccine for young children, some cities are making moves to put tough vaccine mandates into place. Los Angeles will be home to one of the country's strictest vaccine mandates. Customers must show proof of vaccination at indoor restaurants, gyms, shopping malls, nail and hair salons, and entertainment venues and movie theater starting November 4th. Those with religious or medical exemptions will need to show a negative COVID test within 72 hours of entry. And unvaccinated people are facing other restrictions. In Colorado, a woman in need of a new kidney can't have her transplant. The hospital where she was going to have the surgery refused her and her donor since they were not vaccinated. I was extremely stunned. I'm willing to give her my kidney and they just won't let us do it. So I'm a human being who wants to live. The women cite religious reasons for not getting vaccinated. The hospital who refused them says it requires transplant patients and their donors to be vaccinated because they are, quote, at particularly high risk of severe illness. For the first time in a month, the number of Americans applying for unemployment benefits fell. This as the U.S. economy continues to recover from last year's coronavirus recession. The Labor Department says that unemployment claims were down by 38,000 last week. This is the first drop in four weeks since surpassing 900,000 back in January. The weekly applications fell for most of the year. However, those numbers are still higher than they were before the pandemic. Outside with live cam, it is a beautiful day. Another couple of beautiful days until some humidity comes back. So get out and do something in the mornings. That's the best time. You know, even right now. Oh, it's... now you're saying that? Okay. <laughs> Let's see if y'all paying attention. <laughs> Dave is going to go for like a three-mile jog tomorrow. Yeah. We uh -huh. want you to document it, by the way. I will. No problem. Okay.
Uh, yeah, the mornings are the best time, especially as we get into the weekend because things are really going to warm up. The temperature is going to be well above average by Saturday and Sunday. If you're heading out to some games tonight, we do have some high school football games. Weather is cooperating perfectly. This has been a good season for football. We haven't had a whole lot of weather interruptions. Clear and I should knock on some wood right now. Uh, clear and nice. 84 degrees kickoff, 78 by halftime. We'll see clear skies for all those games. Uh, shot here on our KSAC Connect from the uh, the ISS flyover last night. This is from the east side of San Antonio. Adam sent out a push alert letting you know the International Space Station was flying overhead. We got a few shots of it, and we appreciate those as always. We'll alert you if there's a few more flyovers, and I think there are some as we get towards the weekend. We'll let you know. Thank you, Scott, for sending that in. Temperature-wise, in the 80s for most of Bear County and really most of the area. 89 Divine, 83 Uvalde, 79 Lost Maples, the one spot, well, two spots here. Lost Maples and Bernie Stage, right below 80 degrees. But everyone else is starting to see those numbers really crank up here. And we'll be around 91 this afternoon. Sunny skies down to 84 by 7 o'clock, 75 by 10 o'clock. The drought monitor is in. We'll let you know where we stand drought-wise coming up here in just a couple of minutes, guys. Thank you, Justin. Parts of Alabama remaining under a flash flood watch after high water caused danger and death all across the state. As much as eight inches of rain covered roads, trapping people in homes and cars. One death has been blamed on the slow moving low pressure system. The Marshall County Coroner's Office says a child died in the floodwaters in northeast Alabama. The scenes were remarkable. Three feet of water filling up one grocery store near the Florida line and some 250,000 gallons of wastewater overflowing from sewage systems in Baldwin County. Today, most of the state again under a flood warning again. The National Energy Assistant Directors Association predicting gas bills in the U.S. could rise up 30 percent this winter. The National Gas Association of America tells ABC News it does not expect shortages but natural gas market prices are higher due to the economic recovery, strong natural gas demand from last winter and slower than anticipated production. Going forward this year, there are no signs of these prices coming down. One tip to save on your heating bills, the U.S. Energy Department says swapping out an old dirty filter on your furnace can save between five to 15% on your heating bill. Dental Cubs had Antonio and El Paso putting on a goal scoring show last night. Larry Mares with the highlights coming up in sports. After 15 years and five films, Daniel Craig is ready to surrender his license to kill, hang up his tuxedo, shake his last martini, and leave the world of super spy James Bond behind. The film had been delayed several times due to the pandemic, but finally, this week, Bond is back. Here's ABC's George Pinocchio. We are so grateful that we've got here. After numerous pandemic-induced postponements, it's finally time to see No Time to Die. James, fate draws us back together. Daniel Craig announced this would be his last time in the James Bond world, and despite all the hard work and many injuries over the years, he leaves with only fond memories. You know, the fun outweighs everything. And genuinely, it's like I look back now and I look back at the 15 years and of course there's ups and downs, there's bound to be, there's a lot, you know, there's a lot of years in there. Um, but I just look back with fondness about uh, the, the people that I've had the chance to work with. That's been really the, just the, the joy of it all. You are a kite dancing in a hurricane, Mr. Bond. And the experiences I've had are just... I can't, I, I mean, I, I, they, I have flashbacks sometimes of what we've done on these films, and I'm still amazed that we did it, that we, I actually had those experiences. I kind of have to pinch myself still to this day, go, did that really happen? If we don't do this, there will be nothing left to say. As for the delays in the release of No Time to Die, Craig puts it all in perspective. The world has been going through quite a, a serious time and lots of people have been having not such a good time of it. So, um, you know, when a Bond movie comes out, is low, low down the list of priorities. Bond movies 
as, as, as most movies are, but particularly Bond movies are, um, are meant to be seen in cinemas with a crowd of people you don't know that well, with popcorn and drinks and some shouting and screaming, hopefully. And, uh, you know, so we, we, we just, we're just really psyched about the whole thing and just can't wait for people to see it. No Time to Die is rated PG-13. It also features Rami Malek, Lashana Lynch, Rafe Fiennes, Ben Wishaw, and Jeffrey Wright. In Los Angeles, George Pinocchio for ABC News. How many Bonds have there been? Oh, I don't, yeah, a lot. He's been one of the better James Bond. Yeah. Sean Connery was the best. I was about to ask, who's, who's your Don, favorite? Sean Connery. Sean Connery. Yeah. So. Yeah, I'd probably go with that too. All good though, all good. It, it looks like a great movie. At 82 degrees so far today, the low this morning, 66. The averages are 85 and 64. So yes, we're gonna be above average. Look at the records, and this, this shows you kind of how the month of October works out here. We've been as hot as 99, that was back in 1937, and as cold as 43 back in 1964, so a wide range in the records. We're going to be on the warm side of things, at least going into next week before a couple of fronts head our way. We'll take another look at the seven-day forecast coming up. Looking outside, get ready, put on your tennis shoes, take a selfie outside, okay. enjoy it. <laughs> David, we're putting the pressure on you. You realize know, that. Like, now you have to take now, the run Now we, have, we need documentation as well. Yeah. All right, so Saturday morning, I'm going to get up and I'm going to walk outside and I'm going to walk further than my, my vehicle. Okay. I'll do, I'll do so. Fair I'll walk enough. to the end of the driveway, which is. I think you, you should know, do a Facebook Live. Well, yeah. <laughs> Documented yeah. all. It'll be a quick a TikTok. <laughs> a tick tock. Oh, that what? way you're limited on time. Oof. <laughs> I don't even have TikTok yet. I, <laughs> you better hurry up and get it. I, I ain't got past Instagram. Y'all hold on. Insta snap. <laughs> what is that? Anyway, uh, let's talk about the drought. We, uh, we do have a little bit of drought starting to set back in here across Texas. Now, we're still doing okay. 7% of the state was in drought last week. So this is last week's snapshot of where we were. Now let's fast forward to this week. 8% of the state now in drought. Notice some of the yellow color disappeared. And the yellow represents just abnormally dry. We had some rain, so that helps some. But there's a couple spots we're watching down here in our neck of the woods where there is moderate drought starting to return around big wells out towards Eagle Pass. We've been kind of trending in that direction just because our rain events have been few and far between. Let's look at rain chances coming up. We are going to have a small chance Monday morning, another chance on Wednesday with another front. So next week looks a little more active. Of course, last week was active. This week has been very quiet. So we're kind of going every other week here, it feels like. Lows this morning, 62 in New Braunfels, 59 in Kerrville, 63 Carrizo Springs, 57 in Eagle Pass. It was another nice start, although a little bit warmer than what we've seen last couple mornings. Right now, we've got blue skies in 82 degrees. Dew point is at 61, so it's up just a little bit. Notice the wind south southeast at about 10 miles per hour, so that is boosting the dew point ever so slightly. I do think that it falls back down into the 50s this afternoon, so it shouldn't be too, too bad. Temperatures 84 Comfort, 83 Banderas, 84 in New Braunfels, 82 over there at Randolph, 87 in Kennedy in the hot spots. Continue to be Creaso Springs in Catula, checking in at 90 this afternoon. There's a look at the dew points as you get down towards Bevo and Victoria. Yes, it does get a little more humid. Rest of the area, though, right on the borderline of Pleasant and Muggy, there could be a few spots where the dew points jump up into that muggy territory. Not much going on across Texas. This is the visible satellite, so it's like looking down from space. And there's, there's very little cloud cover. We see a few high clouds up in the Texas Panhandle, a little bit of cloud cover around Oklahoma City, but nothing that's uh, producing really any rain. Temperature-wise across the state, it's pretty uniform. 80s for most spots. If you're doing traveling over the next few days, uh, you'll have no issues to contend with. 87 right now in Houston, 85 in Dallas. It's 80 out in El Paso. And here's what our future cast looks like. So things stay relatively quiet, albeit hot over the weekend. We should see the numbers come up a little bit in the afternoon. We could be looking at mid 90s by the time we get into Sunday. Not only that, it's going to be a little bit more humid. A stronger southeasterly wind kicks in, brings in a little more humidity. That's going to set the stage for a couple showers, I think, Monday morning. This is around 8 a.m. We're on the tail end of this system, but there is a small window for rain. As you head off to work or school Monday morning, there could be a few showers around. Right now, we're thinking about a 20% chance. 
On Tuesday, uh, we see that uh, moisture increases a little bit more. That front that tries to move through moves back north as a warm front. Could be a couple of thunderstorms around. And then Wednesday, we get a slightly stronger front, and this brings a better chance for rain. If it can tap into some Pacific moisture, we may even have better chances. But right now, we're shooting for 30% on Wednesday with some showers and storms. For the rest of today, expect those temperatures to dip down to 80 by 8 o'clock, 75, 10 o'clock, then eventually mid 60s by tomorrow morning. 91 on your Friday, 93 Saturday. I mentioned it was going to be hot Sunday, 94, and there could be a heat index. Could feel like it's in the mid 90s. Some rain chances Monday morning, slight chance Tuesday, and there's that uh, chance we mentioned on Wednesday. Guys. Thanks, Justin. By the way, I get my workout done in the afternoon when it's hot, so you get in a better sweat and, you know, you feel Are like you you're telling really... the truth? Yeah, actually. Really? But, but it's indoors. I know. Oh, it's in the air. Well, you do that so you can break out and call it sweaty towel day, right? Yeah. We and that's why. In the air conditioning? A little bit. <laughs> okay, high school football tonight. A big game. Taft, <laughs> Brennan. 29-6A, we're going to hear from both sides coming up. Plus, in college football, UTSA, defense is getting ready to face a very tough quarterback coming up. We're just trying to... After scoring their biggest comeback in school history and their first shutout, now the UTSA Roadrunners are shooting for their best start in school history when they face Western Kentucky on the road this Saturday. When they held off UNOV in the Dome last Saturday, they matched their best start in 2012. Now they're looking to go 6-0 for the first time in school history, but standing in their way is a quarterback from Victoria, Bailey Zappi, who has more than 1,700 yards passing and 16 touchdowns. So what makes him so good? Well, he's tough. He's really tough. Uh, and he's played in the same system so long. You know, he got to do it on the FCS level for all those years against really good FBS teams. I mean, I think he threw for 576 against Texas Tech last year. And then he gets to bring his receivers with him and his coordinator. That's unique. So everything's still the same for him. And he's really accurate. He can really throw it. He can run around. And the system is really good. Kickoff is set for 6 p.m. on Saturday. Now, running back Sincere McCormick needs nine yards rushing to top 3,000 for his career. The KSA 12 TSP Game of the Week tonight will feature the top two teams in District 29 6A, number one Brennan against number six Taft. The Raiders are 6 0 and by playing one more game are leading 29 6A. Taft has beaten Seguin, Veterans Memorial, Holmes, Marshall, Harlan, and Warren by averaging more than 36 and a half points per game behind the one two punch of running backs Justice Hurt and TJ Andrews, who have a combined 18 touchdowns on the ground. For the Brennan Bears, they've beaten Reagan, Clemens, Harlan, Warren, and Stevens, averaging 42 points behind dual threat quarterback Ashton DuBose, who has more than 1,100 yards in the air with 18 touchdowns and another 266 on the ground and four more TDs. I believe it is going to be almost like a playoff game. You know, we're both undefeated. We're both top ranked teams. You know, we both bring what we bring to our you know teams. This is honestly our district championship game. But at the end of the day, like there's a lot of pressure on them. They've no, they've been known to beat us a lot. So there's no pressure on us really. This is probably one of our biggest games of the year. You know, uh, Taps probably are going to be our best opponent for sure. They're undefeated. We're undefeated. It should be a good matchup. Oh, this is an important game. This is basically our district championship. You know, both teams coming in undefeated and yeah, ready to do some great things. And you can see it all live on KSAT 12.2, courtesy of Texas Sports Productions, live tonight at 7. San Antonio FC at El Paso Locomotive FC last night. Stoppage time. Defender Mitch Tainter finds Courtney Ford with a long ball. The on loan Ford heads it in in the 94th minute, tying this match at three. What a beautiful goal. SAFC earns a road point after a six goal thriller. Now, SAFC will return home this Sunday to face Memphis at Toyota Field at 7.30 p.m. All right, Cardinals, Dodgers, last night, National League wild card game, bottom of the ninth, and the Dodgers' Chris Taylor ends this game with one swing of the bat. Two run shot to left field, and the Dodgers win 3-1 to one in walk-off fashion. So the Dodgers will face the San Francisco Giants in the NLDS starting Friday. And today at 3.07 p.m., the White Sox and Astros will start the ALDS at Minute Maid Park. That'll be exciting. Man, I'll tell you what, hitting a postseason homer has to just be so amazing. To make sure you get into the, well, it's a playoff, but not really the playoff. 
if you ask like a lot of people you know, watching though oh yeah absolutely wild card whoo man yeah it's too many right. playoff teams in, the, in baseball hey how about a little hocus pocus is that magic magic <laughs> yep <laughs> that is right and we of course have dead man's toes to finish with your witch's brew this halloween yes and it's also halloween diy week and we're going to start off a little bit of halloween makeup and uh i've always loved doing halloween makeup so we're going to show you some little tips on how to make it look really eerie and spooky and all that <laughs> and speaking of hocus pocus there's some mm -hmm. of my handiwork the voice and the makeup, so. All right, well, if you're a fan of the film Hocus Pocus, actor and musician Larry Bagby, who plays Ice in the film, joins us. And we're going to be chatting with you. You were here for Comic-Con as well. Yes. And we're going to get a performance. But there's something about filming the movie folks may not know, right? I think there's a few things. Okay. But I could give you one of them. That is when we were filming the movie, the very first scene when you see us pop up behind those grave gravestones, that was actual gravestones in an actual witch cemetery. In, in, in Salem, Salem, Massachusetts. Massachusetts. Okay, uh, <laughs> on that note, we have to dress up for Halloween. We're gonna take you to a great costume shop, and who is your favorite villain from the movies? Yes, the Halloween ones. villain of all time. Let us know at SA Live KSAT on Facebook and Twitter. All that and more when we continue in a few minutes.